this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech doing a finance video today. This is the June 2016 finance video and Eternal Masters just came out. Eternal Masters is potentially the highest value set ever printed by Wizards of the Coast at the time of release. This set has some crazy stuff in it and a lot of the finance video is going to be talking about Eternal Masters today because almost everything else in comparison is dropping. People are liquidating other cards to pick up packs of Eternal Masters and play the Eternal Masters lottery. We're going to look a little bit at the EV of the boxes at the end here. One of the big things about this set that has some of the people in the finance world and some people that establish collections really unhappy is the fact that their personal collections are taking a giant hit. This comment from Chase Anders is very, very telling. He's being very honest here. I myself, though, have about the opposite reaction to reprints. Those are some of the cards that were sitting in my build binder. Those are cards that were not currently in decks. I've got a lot more cards from this set that are in decks. And yes, I lost a huge amount of value, but I'm actually really happy about this because the value of cards goes up the more people that play the game. And Eternal Masters is going to blow open cubes generally and somewhat a kind of no reserve list legacy group of people. And then individuals are also really excited about getting into legacy. If you cut the price of legacy decks by 40% and it's just the reserve list cards people need to pick up, those reserve list cards are gonna go up, more people are gonna give the format a try. So I'm super excited. Any value that I lost this week is gonna be back in six months, nine months maybe 18 months at most, because more people are going to be playing these older cards. With any new set, you need to evaluate what should be bought now, what should be bought short term, and what should be bought long term, and what should be avoided entirely, or at least for several months. I have a very small list. It's three cards, you're looking at them on the screen, for the cards that I would pick up currently. The reason that these cards are in a different category than everything else in the set is that they are all-stars across multiple formats. They are hits with casual players and competitive players. Sensei's Divining Top is a powerhouse. We see four copies of Miracles, and each of those use four copies of Sensei's Divining Top in the top eight at Columbus today. Every EDH player that I know, well, 99% of them, really like Sensei's Divining Top. Yeah, they get a little bit annoyed if people can't top quickly, and topping quickly is a skill you really need to learn, both for competitive and for casual if you want to keep your friends and you don't want draws. But so many people enjoy this card that it's going to go up. It's went down about 10% in the last week and it will recover all of that and then some back up to 30 bucks within the next three to six months. Yes, any of these cards, you could wait for the window of opportunity to drop the price a little bit more, but if you miss it and these cards bounce back up, you are gonna be losing five, 10, maybe even $15 a piece on these cards. Force of Will is super popular in cubes, it is an absolute must have in Legacy if you're going to play blue. And it's seeing more play in the semi-competitive to competitive areas of Commander. Yes, Commander is a casual format, but that doesn't mean that people won't play it competitively. Lots of people like to shut down combos or protect their combos. I have seen a lot of people also trying to trade the old Force of Wills into the new Force of Wills. The new Force of Will artwork, I actually believe, is much better seeing it in person. I mean, Therese Nielsen did both of these, but the new artwork is just stunning. I can see the value of these new Force of Wills, which are going to be much, much more limited print run. The original Alliances was printed into Oblivion, and it was only an Uncommon. There's a lot of those out there. These new ones are going to be worth more. 
I would pick up your playset in either one, plus an extra for a cube, one or two extras for EDH decks. This was reprinted at Mythic, so the amount of these that have entered the stream of commerce is much lower than people really realize, and it will start to recover here very quickly. Sylvan Library, normally I don't recommend green cards directly out of a set release, but this green card acts like a blue card. It says draw cards. It says draw cards for life, which in EDH is amazing. In Legacy is incredible. There's lots of decks that don't do any damage to you. Additionally, this is a card that most cube players want a copy of. Yes, out of the three that I'm looking at here, there are some white border versions of this. It is easier to get than the other two, but it is a wonderful card, and I am picking up two extra copies myself right away before it starts to recover in price. In the next 30 to 60 days, I would start to look for some of these other cards that maybe are only popular in one or two formats. They see less play overall. Those cards are dropping currently. I would not buy in heavily, especially not on the foils right now. Baleful Strix, Vampiric Tutor, Intomb, all these foils are higher than they need to be right away. Yes, Baleful Strix, this is the only foil version out there, but it really only sees play in Shardless Bug and the occasional EDH deck. This is not a format all-star in multiple formats, so it's going to drop before it comes back up. The Vampiric Tutor is beautiful in foil. Very good choice of artwork for this. But Vampiric Tutor is played a lot less than Demonic Tutor in EDH. It is not playable in Legacy. So there's less formats where there's an opportunity to really dominate here. Entomb is another one that a lot of people want it for reanimator decks, but it's not the choke point in those decks. The super spiky EDH players also want it but there's a pretty good amount of them out there because of the premium deck that was distributed through Target. We've got another group of cards. I would avoid at least for 90 days. Deathrite Shaman was super heavily printed. I'm glad they put it in this set from a drafting balance perspective, but it didn't need a reprint. As long as it is banned in modern, there's still a glut of Deathrite Shamans out there. Isochronic Scepter was in one of the recent dual decks also. Wonderful card. It really fits the flavor of of the set. I don't feel bad about it being in there from a draft perspective, but from a financial perspective, avoid it altogether. And then Eight and a Half Tails, along with a lot of other cards, just don't have a place in competitive magic right now, and I would avoid them at least for 90 days as they continue to drop. I would hold on to some of the rarer foils, especially those that see legacy and or vintage play. Super popular in cubes also. Chain Lightning, I know it was in the Premier deck. People love this card, and having a foil version of it is very nice. Shardless Agent, the foil is super high right now because it came out as a very limited edition Judge foil. It's going to drop, but I wouldn't liquidate these. Shardless Agent is one of the absolute best cards in Legacy. Shardless Bug is a great deck. It's also a really good card in EDH. People underestimate Cascade in EDH. And Sinkhole is a long-term fan favorite, an overpowered card that just doesn't see much play because most people don't have access to it. Foil Force of Wills are starting to hit the market, and the Judge Foils are dropping like a rock. They're down from that six dollars $500 range. This is an offer that I saw on Facebook the other day. I've had several people offer me similar and even a few slightly better deals than this in person for cash. I would avoid the Foil Force of Wills right now. As the market is dropping, people are liquidating these to pick up other cards that they really want for an Eternal Masters. Commander cards. There's a lot of really good commander cards in this set. I'm going to do a top 10 commander cards from this set, but I'm waiting about 30 days until the prices have really stabilized with regards to the cards. And commander specifically, nobody's playing in a commander tournament next week, or very, very, very few people are. So commander players are more patient for cards to kind of bottom out before they start to pick them up. The growth 
curve on commander cards is fundamentally different than it is on competitive cards. I would wait at least 30 and preferably 90 days before grabbing any commander cards from this set. Standard cards are tanking right now, and this reminds me of when I used to work in a card store right before the 4th of July. Kids would come in and they would liquidate pieces of their collection to go get fireworks, and then they would slowly buy them back over the rest of the summer so that when they were back with their friends in the fall, they had the cards to play. The same thing is happening with regards to Eternal Masters. This is really the 4th of July exciting set of the year, and a lot of people have liquidated other cards. I would avoid 99% of standard right now because the cards are dropping across the board. Jace VP, I thought, would have been immune to this, because Jace is a all-star in pretty much every format, but the stats have proven me wrong there. People are liquidating. I am not getting rid of Jace at his current price. Long-term, he is a wonderful value. Soren or anything that is not eternally playable, I have gotten rid of. There are a few very small exceptions in standard. Ulamog is down to about $12. Wonderful card and is going to be popular in EDH, will be popular in cubes, will be popular with kids. Hedron Archive is another one that I really like in the casual EDH environment. The foils are about $4 right now, and the non-foils are a quarter. After playing this Soul Ring, yes, forecasting cost, so it's not as broken as Soul Ring, but then drawing two cards off of it in a game, most people are happy to trade for one or add one to their deck. Wonderful card, definitely hits the casual market and is very reasonably priced right now. In standard, two more cards that I'm gonna recommend here. One is Tireless Tracker. This card top aided Columbus today in lands. This card is actually really, really good. I underestimated it. I'm throwing one in my mono green EDH deck. I picked up a foil of it for that 90% foil deck. I've still got a few cards that I really need for that deck. The card is great. It's a way to get card draw into green in eternal formats. Also, in this lands deck, everybody sides out their removal for creatures, and then you've got another win condition. The other card that I really like, I believe it was Gary Thompson was playing recently, um, is Oath of Nissa. This is the green ponder. Card selection has always been really rough in green, and if you are not playing eight mana dorks, this is another really good one drop in a green deck to get you to what you need, especially if you have some two casters or three casters that you really want to hit your curve right on. The foils are super inexpensive right now. I can see this as a staple in many EDH decks, maybe even seeing an appearance in modern if there is a deck that having the enchantment in play is useful. This set also did something really interesting, which is shift some cards down to Popper. And Popper is a fast growing format. A lot of people really enjoy Popper. Popper is a great gateway way to get people into older formats, to teach them the rules, and to play with rather overpowered decks. Nimble Mongoose, the Drake here, and the Enchantress are all really inexpensive because they're commons currently. I would make sure to at least get a playset and maybe two or three extra playsets to trade them because of their potential impact on Popper. There hasn't been a lot of press around what is not in Eternal Masters because we had so many great things in Eternal Masters. Flusterstorm is one of those cards that is really tough to find right now. I loaned out my copies to a friend who was playing out in Columbus. Maybe it will see a fall release, but I kind of doubt it. This is one of those cards that they could wait all the way until the next Eternal Masters, two years or three years from now, and make it either a mythic or a rare, and people would be really happy. It has a very niche market, but it's blue and it's super powerful. Crucible of Worlds was not in this set, and this one surprised me a little bit, although I think Crucible of Worlds is going to be in the next Modern Masters, since it is modern legal. I would hold them right now. We've got at least a few more months worth of growth on them. This is a super popular card with the casual crowd and a few spikes. Rishadon Port, this is probably the biggest one from Death and Taxes that was not included. We recently saw Port as a judge foil and that didn't even dent the price. 
the price dropped a little bit because people thought it was going to be reprinted and it not being in Eternal Masters means it's going to be the choke point for people wanting to get into Death and Taxes, which is a competitive tier one or tier two, I put it at tier one, legacy deck that takes a lot of skill but is very rewarding to play. It's also played in the land decks, although your choke point there is clearly Tabernacle, not Rishadon Port. Imperial Recruiter. In fact, all of Portal Three Kingdoms was not in this set, but Imperial Recruiter is one of the few cards that is actually unique in what it does and more powerful than any version out there in other sets. Imperial Recruiter is one of those cards that you need four of in order to play it in Legacy, and it is the choke point for several decks. This is one of the few cards for Legacy that I don't have a playset of, and I would really, really like one. I am trying to complete my playset currently. I've pulled the one that I had in my trade binder out of my trade binder, and I'm trying to pick up the other three. Crater Hoof. We saw a lot of cards specifically aimed at the Elves deck. Almost all of the Elves deck, except one Pasky Land, is available currently to be reprinted. And Crater Hoof is a powerful win condition. This is a card I've probably overused a little bit in Commander because it just goes over the top and allows you to stop stalled board state. It also allows you to win on turn four or turn five extremely consistently with elves in Legacy. I would hold on to these. I would not liquidate them. They're on their way up until they see a reprint. There were a lot of videos put out by individuals and some articles talking about the estimated value of boxes. These were all done before the release day. And as we have seen in the last three to four days, the prices of Eternal Masters cards is plummeting. Lots of cards are down 10 to 20% from their pre-order prices. Or if the pre-order price was set too high, people just aren't picking them up. As this stuff is opened, these prices are going to drop. Anybody who had the boxes at 300 or 280 or 260 or even 240 was a little bit on the delusional side of the value. Now, the real question is what a lot of those mid-range foils settle in at. And I was trying to do research on this three days ago, and many of the big retailers didn't have the price of foils there. So the foils could save the price of boxes, but at this point, I'm actually recommending that unless you're going to draft this or play sealed with it, which it's a beautiful set to do that with, I would buy singles instead of playing the lottery, getting a bunch of cards that you need to trade and watching the trade value plummet. Opening boxes on this a week or two weeks from now is not going to be worth what you could have spent on singles. There are some cards out there in the market that have been a little bit stagnant recently, and the swords fall into that category. I'm trading for and picking up the swords. They are super easy to trade away at their current values. I believe, though, that they're all going to start to creep up in value because of their huge casual appeal and their occasional competitiveness. Sword of Fire and Ice is a competitive monster that is very, very, very powerful in modern, and it's reasonably priced currently. Additionally, I see a lot of trade posts that have surprised me recently. Individuals with reserve list cards are wanting to broaden the number of decks that they can build and are trading away some of their reserve list cards. If you get the opportunity to trade some recently printed cards, even those that are on the buy group here, for staples from the reserve list, I would make those trades. I would easily move any of these recently printed cards into reserve list staples. Not anything in reserve list, but your duels, your top cards, your top 100 reserve list cards are very safe cards to get into. And you have a window of opportunity as people are really excited about Eternal Masters to turn those new shiny cards directly into long-term foundations for your deck building. To cascade into more Magic the Gathering videos every week, subscribe to the channel. For individuals who want early access to these slides, become a patron on Patreon, 
I publish these slides a day or two in advance before the video. Um, and at $5, you get your name in the credits. Thank you everyone so much for supporting Mythic MTG Tech. And until next time, choose the cards wisely.